Who, uh, who likes buying new cars? Oh, David Bland is loving it, apparently. I remember my first car that I bought because it was very memorable. Uh, if anything could go wrong with it, it did. Um, and uh, I kind of had a love-hate relationship with that car. And uh, it started life as an automatic. It ended life as a manual because because the entire engine was replaced at one point. And I'm not mechanical, right? So I, this is absolutely true. I mean, there was one day I couldn't get the car started and I had to be somewhere and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? I popped the bonnet. I literally got a can of WD-40 and went... <laughs> and the car started. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so... Uh, so, yeah, so the car started life as an automatic, and when it changed to being a manual, I was very fearful of driving a manual because I had seen everybody doing the bunny hops and the stalling and all that stuff, and I didn't want to be caught in traffic somewhere and have that happening one day. And So it was really, uh, I was kind of a bit fearful of learning to drive that. Eventually, though, my parents said, well, you're going to have to learn how to drive the manual because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. So, uh, so I had to learn to drive a manual. And actually, now I love driving manual. Uh, cars, it was good fun. Now, here's the point. It's no good having something if you don't then learn to use it, right? It was no good me having this car if it just sat in the driveway and I was, well, you know, I've got a car, I can, I've got my driver's license, but I never get in the jolly thing and drive it anywhere. Or, or it would be useless if I got in the car and went, okay, I'm going for a trip to Victor Harbour and I head off down there and I get to Victor Harbour and the petrol runs out and I go, oh dear, oh well, well that's the end of that car, I'll, I'll get you a ride home and, and that's the end of that. Cars are not like disposable tissues, right? That would be silly. The point is, sometimes you have to recharge, refill. Sometimes you have to learn to read the manual. How many people here love reading manuals? There are two different kinds of people who go shopping at Ikea, isn't there? Like the ones who read the manuals and the ones who don't. We, we know this. You've got to learn. You've got to experiment. You've got to find out what it can do. The car I have at the moment, uh, a few weeks ago, I was driving to church Sunday morning, and this little thing comes up on my dashboard. In three years, I hadn't seen it before. This little snowflake comes up and says, beware of ice on the roads, because it was like one and a half degrees. I was like, wow, I didn't know my car could tell me these things. It's never said this to me before. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. It's no good saying, yes, I've got the Spirit of God in my life, if you don't use it. And this morning, my prayer is, is very clear for you. If you don't know Jesus, then I trust that by the end of the service, you would know him, that you would invite him into your life. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, if you haven't had that experience of, of, of being filled with the Spirit, speaking in that beautiful prayer language, and uh, you can have that happen today. We're going to pray for it in this service. We're going to pray for it at 1.30 in the encounter time. And by faith, as you start to just thank him, praise him, uh, God will enable you through his Holy Spirit um, and give you that gift. Or maybe you've just run dry. It's something that you haven't used in a long time and you need the refreshing of the Spirit. You need the refueling of the Spirit. You can receive that today as well. So are you expecting in your faith this morning? Yeah? Because I'll tell you what, even if you aren't, I am. I am full of faith to be praying for people this morning, and I know our uh, other pastors and leaders here are as well this morning. I want to share with you just a few scriptures and a few thoughts before we have uh, a time of worshiping and, and being in His presence. I want to talk to you about firstly being filled, the initial overflow, that experience of, of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And last week, Pastor Bill gave us four words. He said, here's the process. It's as easy as this. Have we got them up there on the screen? Four words. Love, desire, ask, receive. Now, you might look at that and go, that seems a bit simple. Is it, is it really as easy as that? Well, I think it is. As I reflected on it again this week, I thought, well, 
you've got to love the Lord and be filled with his love as a starting point. Have a love, uh, an honest love for him. Jesus said uh, when he was questioned about what's the greatest commandment, he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. Get that right first. And then as a prior, secondary thing, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. See, once we love God, he enables us to love others as well. And, uh, and so love is important. Well, that's not too difficult. I think most of us here uh, would say we love the Lord. Desire. There has to be a desire, and, and not just a desire for the Spirit of God in your life, but a desire for the old life to, uh, to not have influence in your life. Um, and so let those old things die away. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, follow the way of love eagerly and desire gifts of the Spirit. Well, that's pretty easy. Asking. And that's not too difficult either. Pastor Bill last week used that scripture from Luke 11, where it says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or an egg. If, if, if they ask for an egg, you give them a scorpion. Nobody does that. If you ask God for good things, he will give them. And then the final part is received from that same passage in Luke 11. It says, uh, verse 10, for everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Even then, even if you're not a perfect parent, you still know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's guaranteed. And I think one of the best examples of this in the Bible was from Acts chapter 2, the first time that it happened on the day of Pentecost. So if you, if you remember, Jesus has returned to heaven after his um, resurrection. He was with the disciples for a few more days there. He's ascended to heaven. Uh, they are together for 40 days, just kind of talking, praying, like, okay, waiting uh, for the promised Holy Spirit. And then on the day of Pentecost, it comes. And this is what happened. Let's have a look. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, this is a day of Pentecost for us this morning as we've come together in faith. We're all together in one place. Heart and mind. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And get this, all of them. How many was it? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Who enabled them? The Spirit. It was as simple as that. Sometimes we, we overcomplicate it and think there's more to it. And I've seen many people prayed for in baptism of the Spirit over the, over the years, and I've seen all sorts of different responses. I mean, you know, it talks here about violent winds blowing and, and uh, you know, flames on, on people's heads. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really think, you know, if you read carefully what it says... It says, like the sound of a, a blowing wind. So I don't think there's going to be like hurricanes blowing through this place this morning, right? Or people are not going to just spontaneously burst into flames as we pray for them this morning. Although Pastor Sam is dressed in red here. He's on fire for the Holy Spirit. Come on. <laughs> Holy Spirit dressing, he told me. That's what it's... Uh... Some people laugh, some people cry, some people feel hot, some people feel cold, some people shake, some people feel overwhelmed and have to sit down, and guess what? Some people feel nothing at all. I did not have a metaphysical response when I was prayed for, and I was reflecting on my experience. And if we just flick back to those four words again for a moment, love, desire, ask, receive. As I reflected on my own experience, I was eight or nine years old when, when I received the Holy Spirit, and uh, I remember it very well. I loved the Lord. I loved his church. I would love coming along each week and being in the worship times. I used to watch people worshiping, see them lifting their hands and singing, uh, and then I'd see them praying in tongues. And so I'd say to my mum, oh, what's that about? And so she would explain it 
to me. And so I realized, yeah, okay, there was a deep desire there. I was like, oh, I would like that as well. And so we talked about it a little bit. And then I remember one day I was um, home from school sick. I had a cold or something. And, uh, and so mum used to put uh, worship music on these little things called cassettes. Do you remember those cassettes? And so we used to have worship music playing in, in the house. And as we started to talk, and uh, she said, well, if you want to receive, yep, you just uh, you thank Jesus, thank him. And as you do that, step out in faith, start to pray in that prayer language, and the Holy Spirit will come in. And so that's what we did. We started praying. I started to, to speak in tongues. I said, is, is that it, Martin? Yep, yeah, that's it. And so for the next five, ten minutes, I just continued to pray in tongues, worshiped, and it was a beautiful experience. And I thought, well, there you go. I've made it as a Christian. As an eight, nine-year-old, I've experienced it all now. Not quite. I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more in a moment. But it happened for me as a ten, eight, nine, ten-year-old. I can't remember how old I was. And it can happen for you. It can happen in this service as we, when we pray for you. It might happen at 1.30 when we pray for you in the encounter time. Or... It might be while you're at home tonight praying on your own. Many people come through that way. Pastor Bill was that way as he uh, just prayed for it and, and waited on God at home. He received it at, at home. And so it's the spirit that does the enabling. That is the, the key point. But there's so much more. Yes, there's the initial overflow. And yes, there's that initial um, gift of, of praying in tongues. But... Once you've received the Holy Spirit, you have to keep living in the overflow. I like that little phrase, living in the overflow. Speaking in tongues is, is a little bit of it. People who haven't had the experience or perhaps uh, not Christian looking in, they, they, they tend to think that you know maybe perhaps Pentecostal churches are all about speaking in tongues. That's, that's one part, and it's a great part. But it's not the whole deal. I mean, what does living in the overflow of the Spirit look like? Well, here's just a few things. Christ in you becomes so much more real. That was certainly my experience, that, that uh, as I grew in the Spirit, you, you know, you think after a while you get fed up of hearing the Easter story. You know, every Easter, same story. No, I fall more and more in love with Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. The wonder of our salvation and what we've been saved from grows only stronger and stronger in our life. Prayer becomes so much more intimate. You know, when we're baby Christians, our prayers tend to be the same thing over and over again. Usually the Lord help me prayer, <laughs> which we, we all know very well. But uh, as you grow in your relationship with the Holy Spirit... Prayer becomes so much more intimate. We understand the mind of God. We pray for the things that, that God are in God's heart. There's a great joy that's released in our life. And uh, I've seen that with many people. I don't mean like a silly, happy, clappy kind of hysterical joy. I'm talking about a deep inner satisfaction that we know we're saved, that we know that we are, have eternal life in Jesus. And that when we have the Holy Spirit, we have a power source there that we can be praying and tapping into as we need it. It's a deep inner satisfaction. The Word becomes so much clearer. This one was definitely uh, for me. You know, as an academic exercise, you could read this over and over again and still not get all that God has in here for you. Because it is a now word. His Holy Spirit brings revelation as we read it. And there have been times when I've read stuff, and I know it's completely out of context, but I've felt God speak very powerfully and clearly uh, through his word. And that revelation only comes from having the Holy Spirit as well. Our witnessing about Jesus becomes bolder. The gifts of the Spirit become more operative. So you might kind of think, oh, no, having a word for someone or praying for someone to get healed, that's just for pastors and leaders. Nonsense. Anybody here can do that if you have the faith and you have the Holy Spirit because it's not you doing the work, it's the Holy Spirit in you doing it. 
and temptation and spiritual opposition. They don't go away. Those are realities in our life, but they become more acute and more manageable. We know how to handle those things and, and get through them and stand uh, through that. So we want it to overflow in our life. You don't want it to trickle. My dad is a, a plumber. So we were pretty lucky that we didn't have too many leaky taps unless he was slack and just wasn't keeping up with the jobs that mum wanted him to do. But a leaky, how many of you had leaky taps? You know what it's like. It's annoying, isn't it? Like, you'd be in bed at night and you'd just hear, blip, blip, blip. And after about five minutes of that, you, you're wide awake. You're ready to pull your hair out, or in my case, what's left of my hair. It's annoying. We don't want the drip, drip, drip of the Spirit. We want to be living in the overflow of the Spirit, yes? We want to be enjoying all the, the benefits of that. And there are some great symbols of flow and overflow of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Sometimes it's described like a fresh spring that, that grows into a river. Uh, a wonderful imagery. Look at this from Isaiah 58, verse 11. Have we got that verse there? The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Sometimes you might feel like you're going through a dry season, through a barren patch. And He will strengthen your frame. There are times when we feel weak, when we feel fragile, it says he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. How many of you here like gardening? How many of you here like weeding? Yeah, less hands, I, I see that. You will be like a well-watered garden. This is absolutely true. When I went to Scotland a couple of years ago, and uh, I was driving north from England up into Scotland, and there was two things I noticed. I drove over the border and straight away it started raining and it rained for the next two hours and uh, that's just something that happens in Scotland apparently. And uh, the other thing was I noticed that the vegetation, the trees, the grass, everything was a darker shade of green. You notice it straight away. Why? Because it's got the constant rain on it and it's constantly being uh, revitalized through that. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And this was the learning point for the woman at the well when Jesus met the Samaritan woman who, you know, she's daily going back, getting her bucket of water, little bucket, goes back, it runs out, she has to go back, get another bucket the next day. And, uh, and Jesus says to her, you know what? I've got something that's everlasting. Whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You see, it's a source that we can tap into constantly. Uh, oil and, and the overflowing of oil is another image. In fact, it talks in Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. It's a symbol of being full to overflowing with the Spirit. I think of the story of Elisha and the widow with the, the two sons in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And she has, all she has is this little jar of oil left. And she says, well, I'm just going to sell this, see how much money I can get. And after that, I'm going to have to send my boys off away to work somewhere, pretty much send them into slavery because there's no, there's no, no food uh, left. There's no wealth left for us to live on. And so Elisha comes to visit and he says, well, what can I do to help? And he gets this idea and he says, go around to your neighbors, get as many big pots as you can, borrow all the pots you can, start pouring the oil. And what the oil, the amount of oil you have in the pots, go and sell that to make money. So it probably sounds a bit crazy, but she goes, okay, we'll do it. So her boys go and get all these pots, line them up. She gets her little jar of oil, little tiny jar of oil. She starts pouring, still pouring. Little jar, big pot. Pouring, pouring, still pouring. Huh. The pot gets full. She starts on the next one. Little jar, big pot, 
fills up. She's like, okay, don't know what's going on here, but just keeps pouring. She goes on the next one, fills that one up. She goes on to the next one, fills it up. She fills up all the pots. She gets to the last one. She says, boys, bring me the next pot. And they say, that's it, mum, that's the last one. And at that point, the oil stops pouring. When you are creating space uh, in your life, the overflow continues. And so the spirit will flow as long as we're making room for it in our life. So important to be making space. Don't get left behind. Don't get left behind in what the spirit is doing in your life. Keep up with what the spirit's doing. Have a look at this from Galatians chapter 5, which is the passage about the fruit of the spirit. So Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit, and then he says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the desires of the old life, gone. Focusing now on the desires of the Spirit. And it says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. It's very easy to sometimes assume, okay, well, I've received the baptism, I've spoken in tongues a couple of times, I'm all good to go now. No, you've got to keep in step with the Spirit. When I was a little kid at school, I was relatively bright, but I was a daydreamer. And so I would fall behind everybody else in the class because I was slack, basically. And so occasionally my teachers would come around and say, come on, you know, give me a bit of a prod and catch up to everybody else. And I'm like, oh, okay. I got there eventually. Sometimes it's a bit like with that with the Spirit. We've got to prod our spirit a little bit and say, hey, yep, it's time to keep up. God's doing something new. I need to keep in tune with what that is. Have a look at this from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And that could be uh, any other vice, really. Don't get caught up in vices of the world that just lead to meaninglessness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's what most English translations say. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And I've put a couple of other translations up here because it brings out actually the full meaning of what was in the original text. So some translations say, keep on being filled by the Spirit. It's not just a one-off event. Oh, yep, I've got the Spirit. I'm good to go. You've got to keep on topping it up. You're, nobody else is going to do it for you. You are responsible for the Spirit at work in your life. You're responsible for keeping up with 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 reading the Word and praying. Nobody else can do that for you. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. Or be filled instead with the Holy Spirit and controlled by Him. It's not an out-of-control thing. The Spirit of God is uh, controlled and is dignified. I shared with you my experience of, of that initial infilling. And whether it was just immaturity or what, Maybe I expected that that was, that was it. I was good to go for life. But I certainly had um, significant experiences where I went through dry patches periods because I was not taking the responsibility of, of keeping up with the Spirit. And so the good thing out of that is that I had probably two significant spiritual renewals. One when my teenage years, as I was uh, finishing high school, and um, really felt, uh, found my way back to Jesus, um, grew in him daily, began to operate spiritual gifts. My prayer life grew, my worship life grew, I loved worshipping. Uh, and that was fantastic. And then the second time was in my mid-twenties, a few years later, and that was really more of a faith crisis. Um, still loved the Lord, still desired, but there was like a, a, a spiritual battle going on inside of me. And if you've ever had that experience where you kind of feel you're like you're being pulled apart on the inside, um, what's going on on the inside sometimes comes out on the outside. And uh, it was, you know, perhaps uh, a bit ugly sometimes. And so I really felt like, a, you know, I'd really uh, lost my way there. But as I found my way back to Jesus and began to practice being in his presence... And that's, that's a word for some of you this morning. You need to practice being in his presence. He's not going to chase you around. Practice being in his presence. As I did that, I found a deeper hunger for, for the Spirit. So I didn't just kind of go back to where I was, get back to the good old days. It was like, no, God had taken me on a journey, and I had learned through it. And I trust that I don't ever have to go through a, a, a patch like that again. I remember being at a conference uh, 
and just worshiping the Lord and being obedient. And, and I just heard this little voice say, are you really hungry? Are you really hungry for the Spirit? And something inside of me leapt and just said, yes. And for that, for me, was like a, 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 an awakening to the Spirit. As I was reading through the Word, every time I would read a psalm and read a passage that mentioned the, my soul or the Spirit, um, God showed me something new in it that I hadn't seen before. And, uh, and so I was just so open to the Spirit. And, and a desire for His Word became stronger in me, which was interesting. Um, Pastor Barry Chant um, you said this many years ago, and it's a great little saying. He said, if you've got the Word only, if you just read the Bible as an academic exercise, you dry up because there's no fresh revelation, there's no anointing on it, it's just reading. If you have the Spirit only, if you don't read the Word and you're all about power of the Spirit, he goes, well, you burn up. It's like too much power. You burn out. You need balance. And so he says, with the Word and Spirit working together, what happens is you grow up because you mature in Him. And that, again, is a word for some of you this morning. You need to be growing in the Word and growing uh, in, in being in His presence. So, are you living in the overflow of the Spirit? If you don't know Jesus this morning, like I said, my prayer is that uh, you can know him today. You can receive him into your heart. And as I've been talking about Jesus, maybe that's for you this morning. If you desire his spirit, if you've never had that experience of praying in that prayer language, you can have it. It's not something special for individuals. It's, it's for everyone. And you can enjoy that in his presence. And in a moment, we're going to pray for that. Step out in faith. And as you're thanking him, just using in your English language, step out in faith and stop thanking him in English. And the Spirit will do the infilling and enable you to do that. And the last thing is, if there are some of you here who you just feel like you're dry, you've run dry, you need the overflow of the Spirit in your life, we want to pray for you this morning as well, to be filled and to keep on being filled. Amen? So come on, let's pray together. Band, why don't you come? And I want to invite you, let's just have a time of prayer. This is now time between you and God. So let's bow our heads. Let's begin to reach out to Him in our hearts. If you love the Lord, just tell Him how much you love Him. Let that love and desire just grow stronger in you. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you for your many good gifts. We thank you for your beautiful son who died on the cross for us. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you have only good gifts for us. And that, Lord, as we receive your Spirit into our hearts, that, Lord, you give us, Lord, not just that gift of being able to pray in that prayer language, but, Lord, we receive so much more in you. Lord, we are hungry for you this morning. We desire you more and more. Have your way in this place today. Lord, particularly for people who have come, Lord, desiring to receive that this morning. Lord, work mightily and powerfully in their life as we pray together. Have your way in this place now. In Jesus' name, amen.